So let me st start by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation and also apologizing that uh, I couldn't go and participate in person. Uh, the reason is that uh, I already committed myself to another workshop in Cambridge, and I didn't want to mess up my, uh, my travel schedule, although it was already messed up by the US Embassy, <laughs> and I couldn't go to Santa Barbara. But anyway, <clears throat> so the work I'm going to present today, it's uh, done in collaboration with Romuald Janik. And then we have a preprint on the archive, what you can find in this link. If I would like to start from very, very far, our big motivation was actually to describe ads CFT three-point function in terms of the integrable data. Of, of the solution of the spectral problem, such as Y function, T function, Q function, quantum spectral curve. But we wanted to do it first in a much simpler settings, like in the setting of two-dimensional conformal field theory. If I would like to actually show the, the motivation and place uh, within the scope of this workshop, then uh, where you always take a CFT and then you do some perturbation, then what I would like to do in order to actually describe the CFT, I would like to add a perturbation which is relevant, which leads to a massive scattering theory in such a way that this massive scattering theory is actually integrable. And I would like to use this integrable data and then move back along this uh, renormalization group trajectory, go back to the CFD itself, and then use this basis, which is and, and quantities, which is provided by the, the scattering description exactly at the conformal field theory to describe the data of the conformal field theory. <clears throat> so, so you see, I will take the action of the CFD. I will perturb with this relevant operator and I'm doing it in a finite volume. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on the cylinder of circumference R. <clears throat> and then because this perturbing operator is relevant, it has a non-trivial dimension and the coupling <clears throat> constant itself will have a dimension. And if you would like to calculate some physical quantities, then it appears in this uh, finite volume setting together with the volume. So in order to control this renormalization group flow and switch off the perturbation, you could put the lambda perturbation to zero, <clears throat> but alternatively, you could also just analyze the very small volume limit and then uh, analyze what happens in this case. And the aim, as I told you, we would like to calculate the three point function and uh, the spectrum was already calculated in terms of the scattering data, okay? So let me just explain first, uh, sorry, what is the, the characterization of conformal field theories on the plane? So we are on the plane now. And the first thing you would like to calculate is the one-point function. And then I would like to point out that in calculating the one-point function of local operators are zero, but they are zero only, if, uh, if the, the state, what I denote by zero here, is the SL2 invariant state. And in, uh, in a unitary theory, this would be the vacuum state, but in a non-unitary theory, actually the ground state, the lowest energy state, is not the SL2 invariant state, okay? So in this case, the ground state expectation value of fields will not vanish. But if it's the SL2 invariant state, then I can use conformal symmetry actually to learn a lot about the correlation function. And the one point function is just zero. The two point function, you can uh, normalize the field such a way that uh, it's uh, what appears is, is the delta function. So you normalize basically one and uh, it has this universal form and the quantity which appears in the two point function is the conformal dimensions of these fields. You could go to the three point function. And then once you already, you used your, your freedom to normalize your operator, then the, the three point function will have a non-trivial constant, this three point coupling CIJK. And otherwise, uh, 
the space-time dependence is completely fixed by the conformal invariant. And this three-point coupling, it's exactly the same quantity which appears in the operator product expansion. So if, if, if in, in CFTs, you can just uh, bring two operators close to each other, and then you can express this bi-local operator in terms of uh, local operators, and the expansion uh, coefficients are exactly these three-point functions. So if you know the three-point function, if you know the conformal dimensions, then you can describe all correlation functions in principle in a CFT. So this means that the conformal field theory is characterized by these quantities. Once more, they characterized by the conformal dimensions and the three-point functions. And we would like to calculate these quantities from integrability. Uh, uh, Jolie, in previous yes. slide, so if the, the, the vacuum is not a set invariant, what happened to this two-point function? This two-point function is like a four-point function. Right, but uh, it, you say because you can you can always trade states with uh, with operator. There is the state operator map. So, for example, if you replace this zero with say phi, which is the ground state, then then it is obtained this state as acting with the primary field phi on the SL two invariant state and sending the argument z to zero, and then here in an appropriate way to infinity. So this is a kind of limit of the four-point function. So it's so much more complicated. And this formula on the right-hand side is slightly changing? No, it's the... completely changing. It's no longer true. It's a very non-trivial function, yes. But it still depends on Cij. It depends on Cij, but you cannot use conform invariance to bring into this very simple form. Uh, so it's not just exponential change? No, I think not. But uh, I think not, no, no, no. Because you have to use this conformal prop the representation of the four point function and then you have to make this limit. I would okay. say it's, uh, it's, it's not even a function of the difference of this uh, Z on, Zi and Zj. It will be a function separately on Zi and Zj. Well, you are taking this uh, other two coordinates to zero and infinite, so. Yes, not... yes. Hmm? If you take uh, so what I so what we are talking about replacing this uh, zero with phi, yeah, this you can think of as an operator at uh, z equals zero, and then uh, you would uh, write the, uh, the parametrization of the four point function, and then you will have something like z j minus that zero to some power. So you you will also have a function of uh, z j. Okay, itself to some power. And then you will have a function, which is a function of the conformal cross ratio of zero, zj, zi, and infinity. And I think it's non trivial. And then it would be a function even of that quantity. Okay. So it's so complicated, I don't want to talk about <laughs> But But actually, in this case, you can use just the the operator product expansion in the middle of OI and OJ. And then uh, you can write also these quantities in terms of three point functions. OK, but that was the story on the plane. And I told you I would like to work on the cylinder. On the cylinders, everything is dimensioned full. So for example, uh, instead of thinking local operators, you can think of the corresponding state. And you, you would like to calculate the dimension of this state, the energy of this state in, a, in this finite volume conformal field theory. So then by dimensional arguments, it should go like one over R, R and then what multiplies it is the conformal dimension. So if you would like to extract, for example, the conformal dimension of an operator or describe in an integrable way, then you have to just calculate the spectrum and then go to very a small volume and you will see the dimensions. Similarly, if you would like to calculate some matrix element on the cylinder, then this can be written up to this dimension full factor as a three point function on the plane. So in this talk, I will be interested exactly this expectation value of operators in a finite volume. I would like to small volume. 
and I would like to analyze three point function, but only in the case when these two operators are the same, O1 and O2. So I'm, I'm just considering like expectation values and not more complicated matrix element or other words, three point functions when these two fields on the two other sides are the same. And I will do it in this first uh, approach only in the Li Yang and the Boss models. <coughs> So this problem, actually in the Li Yang conformal field theory, say for the spectrum to describe the spectrum in an integrable way, was already done. There is a beautiful paper by Bozhanov, Lukianov, Zamolochikov. When they constructed actually the analog of the integrable transfer matrix within the conformal field theory setting, and they could show that the the transfer matrix or the Y function, actually these two things are the same in this simple model, they satisfy a functional relation, which is written here. And I would like to mention that we also got the same result just by analyzing an integrable lattice theory, an integrable uh, spin chain like models by taking its continuum limit and then we got the same functional relation. Now, once you have this functional relation and you know the asymptotics of your function. So for example, you have the functional relation for the left movers and the right movers, because in the CFT, we have the holomorphic factorization. We can calculate uh, uh, dimensions, left and right dimensions independently. So we have functional relations uh, independently or, or uh, for the two chiral halves and they are independent. So they have these particular asymptotics, what I'm showing here. And then assuming, for example, that there are no poles or zeros, then, uh, <clears throat> then you can solve this functional relation. And the way you solve actually to, to just actually divide by y, this relation, you take the logarithm and you invert the appearing shift operators. And then you can derive this, uh, integral, nonlinear integral equation for the logarithm of the y function. This actually is equivalent to the thermodynamic beta ansatz equation, but we obtained it a slightly different way just from the functional relation following Bajanov, Lukianov, and Zamolochikov. Once you solve this integral equation for your epsilon and you plug back to this formula on the right, then you can calculate these conformal energies which is sometimes called the effective central charge, which contains the, the sum of the dimensions of the, the, <clears throat> the state, which has the, the least energy minus the central charge minus 12. So this is the expression what you could get just by integrating this solution. Of course, solving this equation, it's, uh, it's not really possible, but using the dial logarithm trick, knowing that it satisfies this integral equation, knowing explicitly what is the kernel, you can actually calculate these dimensions and you could see that indeed see it, is, it describes a model with central charge minus 22, 2 over 5 and conformal dimension minus 1 over 5, which is the simplest possible conformal field theory you can imagine, because this is the linear model. Actually, you could interpret the same number in a different way. And this interpretation would be the perturbation of the POTS model. And this would be actually the POTS cron state. And then I, uh, I also mentioned that you can extend this analysis for excited state, for example, plugging in the analytic structures of poles or zeros, then uh, you can describe also excited states. And even you can generalize for boundaries and defects. And then you can analyze boundary flows, defects flows. And we did it in these papers in some detail. So what is the aim? The aim is use this y function, which is completely defined within the CFT real and try to calculate, extract the three point function purely in terms of the Y function. So I will do it in my talk, just uh, I would like to refresh and explain a bit uh, what information is contained in this Y function. So the Y function, you could see, this is a kind of dressed version of, of the exponential e to the S, for example, for the right Y function. 
So it really grows. So it's better to draw actually the inverse of the phi function. And then, then it has this king form. They, they call it the king. So this is like a king, which for negative thetas, theta going to minus infinity, it goes to a plateau value. And you can calculate this plateau value just plugging a constant into the integral equation. And then it's an algebraic equation, but you can solve. So this is the plateau value. But what is important, how it actually approaches the plateau. And then if you focus on this tail, then you will see some exponential corrections. And this goes like e to the 6 over 5 s, which is related actually to the dimension of the would-be perturbation, which, which would lead to an integrable perturbation. But there is another interpretation of the same term, namely uh, that uh, because the y function is the transfer matrix itself, and this is the expansion of the transfer matrix for s going to minus infinity. So the appearing term is nothing but the eigenvalue of the non-local charge of this ground state. And the second term is the second non-local charge and so on. Similarly, if you would expand for large theta, for large s, yeah, this rapidity I call in the conformal setting s. So if you ex expand it for large s, then you will have a regular expansion e to the minus s, 2s, and the coefficients appearing here, the eigenvalues of the local charges. So this transfer matrix or y function is a beautiful object. It contains for any state already all the local and non-local charges. What you have to do, you have to just uh, somehow cleverly expand this function and then calculate these charges. For example, in this is portion of Lukian of Samologic of paper, they did this calculation and they calculated the first few non-local and local charges explicitly. Uh, hi, Zoli. Uh, yes. I have a question here. So how do you see that numerically you can extract this precise value, 6 divided by 5 or 12 divided by 5? It seems like some very small number. What do you mean? I mean, uh, <clears throat> you can very easily solve numerically the TBA. It's yes. no question. Yes. Uh -huh. and, yes. Then, and then you just go to this domain. You subtract uh, the plateau value. Okay. Right. You take mm -hmm. logarithm and you fit it. And then depending how precise your numerics, you will see like for five, 10 digits, uh, this number. Uh, okay. So numerically, it's very easy to extract this number. Mm -hmm. Analytically to calculate them, it's not so easy. And I have mm -hmm. to tell you that the original calculation of BLC actually doesn't rely on the TBA. It relied some conformal field theory calculation in both cases. So it's a kind of open problem how to extract these quantities analytically. But, okay. uh, but to, to extract the exponent, well, I can extract uh, by solving the integral equation using the Wienerhoff technique, but that is a, even a simpler way because mm -hmm. if you go back to the Y system, then you can prove that the Y function actually has a periodicity, just, just Using this Y system equation, you, you can plug back several times the Y function into itself, express it, for example, the Y function at S plus I pi over three in terms of the other two Y functions. And that if you repeat several times, then you will see that Y function is periodic. And then it's easy to understand because you have some periodicity. And then these terms should respect this periodicity. So that's why uh, you can read of even the exponent from the periodicity of the y function. I see, thanks. So very good. So, so that was about the conformal field theory, but I would like to do actually to, to for example, calculate this three point function and describe completely in terms of this y function. Okay. And but in doing so. Uh, can you repeat it? I, uh, I couldn't understand. Y system, how do you know the periodicity? I mean, you just uh, start to plug, plug back into itself. Yeah. Y system already determines the periodicity. Uh, is it obvious from Y 
by system equation? Yeah, I think so. It's a like a one line calculation or in the from this Y system, just two line calculations probably. Um, I mean, you are, so you, you are see, in... I think the, the periodicity is like uh, phi I pi over three. This gives a periodicity, but on analytical, I don't know, from the equation, it's not so simple. You plug it in in mathematica, it's so it Yeah, up, right. It goes up after phi Right, so that, that you know, but uh, it's not obvious from two lines, I don't know. When yeah. it's... I mean, for numerically solving, it's absolutely not, because you have to analytically continue, and then when you do the continuation, this kernel, I will show a bit later, it will have actually poles. And then when you move away, then you have to pick up the residues of these poles. And then, but from the Y, y system itself, it's easy to prove the periodicity. Okay, so I would like to express three point function in terms of the Y function. And then these Y functions I are explained to you are the Y functions of the conformal field theory. And naively, I, I cannot do it now, but the idea is what I already explained. So why don't we perturb the CFT with some relevant operator such that the theory is a massive scattering theory. Then I could use this scattering description and calculate say the energy spectrum for any volume and then moving back with the volume I could read of the, you, you could already see the CFT dimensions, but I will show in a minute that you can read of also the, the free point function of the perturbing operator. So this is what I'm going to do. But here, I just would like to point out that uh, depending on the CFT, you might have many integrable deformations. So, so you could perturb with lambda, it's integrable massive scattering theory, but in some other theories, you could use another perturbation, which is still integrable. And then you could move back in different renormalization group flows. So a CFT usually admits many different uh, scattering descriptions, same CFT. Okay, so, but I will pick now in the Li-Yang model, we have only just one relevant perturbation, so I don't have to think much which one uh, I choose. I have a question here, sorry. Sure. So if this is your idea, then does it mean that uh, you can only compute some very specific three-point function? Namely, one of them has to be this perturbing operator you are considering. Yeah, that's true. But uh, I will have one slide at the end how I, I will try to overcome this problem and generalize a bit. And then what I will use, I will try to move into the direction of what Smirnov formulation, because Smirnov already understood actually how to, to replace the perturbing operator with some other operators. Okay, so I will comment okay. then. But indeed, I will get uh, expectation value of the perturbing field. But you see, if I can choose uh, this uh, some other field as a perturbation, and if it's integrable, then I could also calculate expectation values of that other operators. Yeah. Right. And also, yeah, but I will comment the... uh, on the general case. Yeah. Okay. So another question is uh, usually, what kind of field theory also depend on the sign of this uh, lambda? So does it matter in your approach here? Yeah, actually, yes. But, uh, and that's a very interesting question and we should investigate. But uh, here in the Leon case, it doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. indeed, if I would take like this uh, trick criticalizing, then depending on the sign, I could go either uh, for the icing, which is a massless flow, or I could go to some massive scattering theory. And then I could go back. So we analyzed only the massive scattering description. But uh, but see, what I'm going to say on this slide, it's true for any sign. Because what I first, very naively, I can easily do is perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. So I have a Lagrangian or, or Hamiltonian action. 
I know how it looks like. I know the CFT itself. I know the correlations of co co correlation function of the CFT. So I can express the change in the energy in perturbation theory. Okay. So it's a perturbative expansion in the coupling constant lambda. And then what I will obtain at different orders. So as I told you, they, this uh, power of lambda and the volume comes in the, always the same combination because this, this, so this is dimension energy. So it should go like one over the volume. <clears throat> so what is in the bracket is dimensionless. So they always come together, <clears throat> this dimensionless combination. And that leading order, this is nothing but the expectation value of the perturbing operator in this state. So I can relate to the free point function. If I'm analyzing the ground state, which I will analyze first in a unitary theory, actually, then what I will see that this term vanishes. But then if it's the SL2 invariant state, then the next term, which uh, has the, this is the integrated two point function. So if I'm in a, uh, I calculating the finite size uh, correction perturbation of the SL2 invariant state, then the second, the first coefficient is zero and the first non-leading coefficient, which is the second coefficient has this generic form. And this can be explicitly integrated depending on the dimension of the field. But uh, coming back to Changrim's question, if I were in the Li-Yang theory, then the first coefficient is non-zero for the vacuum. And the, this coefficient would be the integrated four-point function, which is a very complicated object. And then I cannot integrate. Probably if I could spend some <laughs> very long time, I could, but I, I don't want to. So, so let's just uh, make this point. Actually, the Leon model and the Potts model ground state energy are basically the same up to a factor of two. But the interpretation of the expansion of the ground state energy at very small volume, it's quite different. Because in the Leon, the, it's a non-unitary CFT. So the ground state is, uh, is a state have, which has dimension mi minus one over five. So this corresponds to the actually the same perturbing field. So the leading correction, volume correction after the effective central charge is nothing but the free point function what I would like to calculate, okay, in the Li-Yang model. The same term as a functional form in the Potts model, however, can be interpreted as the second term in the expansion, because in this model, this uh, unitary theory, the perturbing operator doesn't have an expectation value. So this will be immediately uh, give me this generic form, this generic term, generic perturbation. So, and that's what I explained here. It doesn't matter what is the sign of the lambda, because this is just perturbation theory. It's, it's valid for any sign. But what really matters is the end of the flow if I turn on this lambda. And uh, in the Li Yang theory, this is a scattering, uh, integrable scattering theory, <clears throat> which has one single particle, which scatters on itself with this S matrix. This is the simplest possible S matrix you can imagine. Uh, it's like one CD defector, which has a pole in the physical strip. And the physical meaning of this pole then this particle on scattering itself actually can form a bond state, which is the particle itself. We learned from Alyosha Samolochikov how to calculate the ground state energy from this S matrix. So you take the logarithmic derivative of the S matrix, and then this you use as a kernel, and then you solve uh, this thermodynamic beta ansatz equation in which you have this small r parameter, which is the dimension less volume, which is the mass of the particle times the physical volume, you have to solve this TB equation. Once you've solved it, you plug back to the energy formula and you will get the ground state energy. How does this ground state energy compare to the ground state energy I calculated in the perturbed conformal field theory settings? So there are two very important and basic differences. The first, while the previous one was based uh, on the Lagrangian. 
So it was based on a UV description of the theory. It contained the parameters of the, of the UV theory, so lambda. But this other description of the ground state energy, which is valid for any volume, not just, uh, so the previous was valid in the perturbatively in the coupling. But this is for, it's, it's exact for any volume, although it's not actually uh, very explicit, but it's, it's exact for any volume. And it, it is starting from the, say the infinite volume limit. And then it can go back, but since it starts from the infrared, it, it, it is written completely in terms of the infrared uh, parameters, which is the mass of the particle. And by dimensional arguments, you, you can immediately tell that this lambda should be related to the mass of the, of the particle in this particular way. So lambda as a dimensional full parameter actually sets the scale of the, the excitations. And the relation between, this is the kappa function, this is a very non-trivial function. And then uh, it's not easy to calculate. And this is a $1 million question. If you could do the same calculation in like QCD, calculate the mass of the hadrons in terms of the, the quark masses, then you, you will get this price. So it's a very difficult question. And I will show actually that our approach can, can provide this kappa. So this kappa, it's the relation between the UV and IR, highly non-trivial. So that's one difference between the two. The other, that when, when Alyosha derived this, uh, this thermodynamic beta answers for the ground state, then we started from the infrared and we normalize the ground state energy such a way that if we go to infinite volume, it goes to zero. But this is not true. The conformal uh, perturbative expansion of the ground state energy started in the, in the UV and then it started from the UV central charge, effective central charge. So the difference between the two, it's a universal constant, a bulk energy constant, which is uh, specific actually for this theory, but universal in the sense that if you introduce boundaries or defects, it's still the same. So it's proportional to the volume. And that's, that's basically the difference between the two descriptions. So what does it mean? It means if I take the TBA, ground state energy, and uh, make it dimensionless, and I would like to express at very small volume, then the leading term will contain information about the scaling dimension of the operator. The first subleading term, sometimes uh, the other is, uh, is, is the first subleading, but the universal term in these settings, which is proportional to R squared, is the bulk energy constant. And then the next term, this epsilon, let's call it epsilon one times R to the alpha, it contains information alpha is basically the dimension of the perturbing operator, okay? And epsilon either contains information about the free point function, if the free point function is non-vanishing, like uh, not SL2 invariant state, or if it's the SL2 invariant state, it contains information about the mass gap because this quantity, uh, you calculate it here in terms of the mass, but, but, uh, but you, you can calculate it uh, in terms of in perturbation theory. And then in perturbation theory, you see this, this just depends on this, uh, this second perturbative correction appearing here. Yeah, lambda square, you see, so kappa square should appear. So in this universal form, so you just compare with this term with lambda and kappa. So, so for calculating this quantity for the SL2 invariant state, you can extract the mass gap. And then while uh, once you know the mass gap and you calculate for any other non-vanishing state, you can extract the three point function. So that's the idea. The idea is you take the TBA and you expand it. You see the conformal dimension. You see the bulk energy constant, but you have to calculate the next order. Term. Okay, so I have to tell that uh, I visited the Alyosha Zamolochikov with Chaho Rim, actually we collaborated with Chaho, uh, in Montpellier. And then we worked on some other TBA, Singe Gordon TBA boundary, but I, I just raised in some discussion that I'm really much interested in how to expand exactly this TBA and calculate epsilon one. And he got so excited 
And then he asked me, Zoli, so what is your insight? How do you want to do it? And then I, I said, well, I thought I will just uh, solve numerically and look uh, carefully the terms. And he got so disappointed <clears throat> that I also got disappointed for some time that it's an impossible problem because of course he tried this <laughs> for very, quite some time and then uh, he was not satisfied what he got and uh, he just uh, didn't solve it. I'm not sure what or solution uh, what I will provide now is, uh, is he was not aware of, but maybe he was not satisfied with it, but I think it's a nice solution. <clears throat> and this is basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to calculate this epsilon one guy in terms of the, the conformal field theoretic Y functions, <clears throat> this Y R and left, okay? <clears throat> so now I will explain the calculation. So the calculation uh, goes as follows. You take the TBA <clears throat> and then you go to small volume. And then you plot maybe one over Y, sometimes you plot log one plus one over Y, and you will see the following. It has a middle plateau region and it has a king located at minus log R over two, and then in a very in a small volume limit, very very far away, you have the anti an anti king located at log r over two, <clears throat> and then you can see that this king satisfies that king equation. So it <clears throat> yes, and then this this is the anti king equation. They are basically the conformal kings. If you just this r over two can be defined into the argument easily. So this, this king functions, the function which approximate the solution here, it's basically the conformal right solution, right king <clears throat> shifted, and this is the left king shifted. So the, it's easy to make the asymptotic solution, which consists of the conformal shifted right king, and then the conformal shifted left king, they multiplied, and then here, and then we just remove the plateau band. So this is the asymptotic solution. And the question I already wanted to analyze that time, but we analyzed later with Romuald, was uh, so how, what is the deviation of the exact solution and this asymptotic solution? <clears throat> so what you do, you take, for example, the inverse of the y function and you subtract the, the asymptotic solution. So this was the, the, the say the solution, numerical solution of this, uh, Finite volume problem, this is the King solution, you subtract. And what you see, the difference is very, very small. And if you go to small volume, then it is actually proportional to the volume to this 12 over five factor. So this is the size, but otherwise the shape, it's very similar. It has a King, uh, its own King, its own anti-King and some asymptotic value. So question, so what is the integral equation the small deviation satisfies? And then in order to calculate, you just expand the TBA. And then because you expand, you will have a linear integral equation with this generic kernel. Yeah, this is the kernel you would uh, obtain if you would like to analyze actually small fluctuations around uh, the TBA solution. So it's the same thing. So you have this linear integral equation with a source term, which is uh, that, de that deviation. But uh, you can actually replace this uh, R over two E theta with the King solution, with the anti-King solution. So you can rewrite the source term into this form. So this is a convolution bit phi, the logarithmic derivative of the S matrix. And then some source term, which I denote by G, K, A, which means it also depends on the kink and the anti-kink part. <clears throat> okay, so let's investigate this source term a bit. I told you this source term has also this kink, anti-kink, and plateau shape. So let's calculate its kink part. So what I'm, I'm going to do, uh, I would like to see, so we can explicitly calculate how they look like. And then I, so this is the small source. And what I'm going to do, 
I'm, I'm just focusing on this king domain. So I'm, I'm shifting uh, coordinates around. Uh, and then uh, what is relevant in order to understand its behavior, you see that, uh, so it has the king and the anti-king solution, but uh, the anti-king in this domain is very, very small. So we have this anti-king and that this is basically exactly the asymptotics determined by the non-local charges, okay? So in this domain, I can just expand uh, my king solution and what appears exactly the, what appears exactly the, the tail, how the anti-king approaches the plateau and the leading asymptotic charge, the leading non-local charge. So the leading non-local charge actually determines you the volume dependence, how far we are from the anti-king because this size was twice log uh, R over two. So, so you see this small piece, what appears in the, the source is proportional exactly R over two to the 12 over five. This is what we have seen numerically. So in order to focus the leading correction, the leading volume correction, we can project out that part, the leading one, just multiplying with R minus 12 over two and taking the limit. And then in this limit, this king part of the source has a completely well-defined form and it's written field. So it contains the king solution, the conformal king solution now, minus its asymptotics and multiplied with the tail of the anti-king solution, which is an explicitly known function. So this source now it's written completely in terms of CFT data <clears throat> and the small deviation can be also decomposed a small king deviation and an anti-king deviation. And the small king deviation satisfies this linear integrality, <clears throat> where the source storm is exactly this CFT source. So once we know this linear integral equation, we would like to calculate the, the, this leading correction to the energy. So this is the full energy. And then uh, we know it has this expansion, what you can see here. So conformal uh, dimensions, bulk energy constant, and this is what we are hunting for, epsilon one. So what we do, we, we expand around the asymptotic, in the asymptotic log one plus y to the asymptotic, we replace into this other term and the difference is nothing but the source term, what will appear here. And here we can recognize the first piece as the central charge, the second two piece as the bulk energy constant. And these two terms combines very nicely together and using the analogous of the dialogue trick, we could calculate and write the result into a form where we actually do not have to solve this linear integral equation with that source, but it has this expression only in terms of the source and the derivative of the King function. So let me just point out that the central charge, it has this formula, but there is a very nice trick that you can actually evaluate this integral. The dialogarithmic trick, it will give the central charge. There is another very nice trick to calculate the bulk energy constant. So this integral, which gives you uh, this epsilon bulk. But unfortunately, we couldn't find a nice trick yet how to calculate this quantity, which would give analytically uh, the kappa relation or the free pump function. <clears throat> but uh, conceptually, this is our result, OK? This result came from the, the right king region. And then in order to calculate this epsilon one completely, you have to add the similar contribution from the left king. So this is the, the result of our calculation. We calculated this epsilon one purely in terms of the CFT data. And then from this, you can extract the free pump function. Okay, so let me just summarize what we got. <clears throat> So we, call, we, ex, we managed to expand. So this was a problem which resisted the solution for a very long time to calculate actually this epsilon one. And then we could manage to write this epsilon one, and in this case, the three point function in terms of this G source term and the derivative of the, 
of the logarithm of the, the kink function. So these are purely CFT data, okay? It's, it's, it's contained in the integrable description of your conformal field theory. The source term, once more, it has a part coming from the king and, and also it has another part, which is the tail of the anti-king. So somehow this guy contains the interaction between the king and the anti-king. And then the, this is responsible for this epsilon one. So this we did, we, we couldn't unfortunately evaluate analytically this integral, we evaluated numerically and in the Li Yang model, we already know this three point function. Actually, the aim is not to calculate the three point function, just to understand how to calculate them in terms of the integrable data, because we hope that something similar uh, could be used in the ads CFT setting. So this we did here for the ground state, and you remember this, this kappa is still here. So in order to extract kappa, you have to repeat the same analysis or generalize this analysis for excited state, because uh, in order to, to extract kappa, I told you, you have to calculate the expansion of the, the energy when you have the SL2 invariant state. But the SL2 invariant state in the scattering description is not the ground state, but this is already a, the first excited state. So you have to repeat this calculation, TBA expansion for the first excited state. And we did this calculation. And then uh, actually this nice trick what uh, Roberto and, uh, and, and Patrick figured out the analytic continuation to get the excited state by analytical continuation it turns out that it works also here in our formula. You take just the formula and you do the analytic continuation, then you will get exactly this uh, epsilon one for the excited state from which you can extract the mass gap relation and then plug in back, you will have an expression for the three point function. And then indeed a good question, but uh, Jung Feng asked, how can I describe other operators? So I will talk a bit about this now. So, so far we described the perturbing operator and the perturbing operator is related to the, to the trace of the energy quantum tensor. And uh, you can just rewrite the result, what I explained in terms of another problem. So, so the trace of the, the expectation value of the trace of the energy momentum tensor can be written like the derivative of the ground state energy plus one over R times the ground state energy. And what is nice about this combination is, uh, I, I'm just written here the result. So it, it can be written like e to the theta times this age of theta with the convolution which contains the y function. And age of theta satisfies this linear integral with the same kernel, I like the linearized fluctuation, like, like this delta y was, uh, with the source term, which is e to the minus theta. So we can think of, so it satisfies this, this equation, but this uh, bullet, or, uh, it's basically an iterated convolution where the convolution has, uh, has this, uh, this measure, one plus y. And just, yeah, that, that's the basically the definition. So phi bullet age is this integral. Then uh, it's not just a convolution, but you have a measure factor one over one. So in this sense, age is nothing but the dressed version of e to the minus theta, okay? So all result can be re-interpreted re as, uh, as a convolution of e to the theta with the dressed version of e to the minus theta. And these are exactly the quantities. So it's like omega one minus one in this language. So this is exactly the quantities which appears in Smirnov formulation. So Smirnov says that, uh, for example, in the Sinch Gordon theory, which we hope it's analytically related by analytic continuation related to the Li Yang model. So in the Sinch Gordon, uh, there is this paper of uh, Smirnov and uh, also Stefano. I'm, I'm not sure he's here. So they have how to express actually the expectation values 
of exponential operators uh, in a finite volume in the Singe Gordon theory. And they have a generic expression uh, which can be specified just for the perturbing operator. And this is what I, I, I transformed my result uh, for the perturbing operator, because this is related to the trace of the stress tensor. You can write in terms of this omega one minus one. So the point I would like to make first that, uh, so here we described uh, just one operator so far in my talk, but we know how to, to extend it at the language of omega. So for example, you can just introduce this general omega nm, which is the convolution of e to the n theta times uh, the dressed version of e to the m theta. Actually, this convolution is symmetric for the dressing. And then you can easily show that the conserved charges can be expressed even in the Li Young model by omega s1, omega s minus one. And then in his language, he actually understands how to generalize this setting to describe the expectation values for other operators, where in the exponent, you not just have e to the b phi, it's not the cardinal phi, it's, it's just the field phi in the singe Gordon theory, sorry. Uh, when you put an alpha here, and then you have to deform this, uh, this scattering matrix kernel in a very specific way. So, but unfortunately in the Leon model, we don't have uh, uh, other operators. We have only the phi and then we already calculated the phi. So if you would like to calculate something non-trivial, we have to go to some other model, okay? And then formulate Smirnov formulation in this other model. Um, so I have so, a question here. Yeah. So is uh, Smirnov's formulation uh, easy to generalize to other theories? Or it's like no, specific. No, no, no. It's somehow well. So <clears throat> no, it's a very good question. And then we don't know actually how to generalize for the Li Young. We know it. it it's formulation in the Singe Gordon, and mm. then the Singe Gordon particle is by analytical continuation the S matrix goes to the Li Young. So for the Li Young one specific operator, it works. Right. But originally. He has a series of papers with Jimbo and Miva, and also some other varying collaborators, like seven papers, I don't know. And they That's developed good. this whole techniques for the sine Gordon theory. So actually we are working now on in the sine Gordon theory for generic operators and uh, going to the small volume limit and expanding this NLIE and getting the expectation values of uh, generic operators. But from the point of view of minimal models, I would say it's even enough because we know that certain twisted versions of that NLIE describe the minimal models. And this is the next step we would like to do. We would like to, to take a minimal model, say pair to with 513, and then this can be related to the sine Gordon, twisted sine Gordon. Then we, we know Smirnov formulation works there. And then we could just take the limit and then see what comes out. So I this see. is a, yeah, so this is I what see. we are doing. And then, uh, well, so it's, uh, it's I, I should say in this respect, it's quite generic, this formulation. <clears throat> so does this uh, trick, relies on this fermionic basis that's yes so yes absolutely yeah so so how smirnov derived this formula this this one or the generalization it's exactly there is a kind of fermionic basis you have uh, some extra operators fermionic operators which do not really act on the states on the hilbert space but they act on the operators and then actually, you know, when you act a fermionic generator, then how they act on omega. So you can express the expectation values just by acting with the fermionic generators and very nicely. Yeah, that's what he does. Yeah, so I think my time is quite up. Just I one have a question. Yes. So um, in this mini formula, where is our dependence coming in? Uh, where is R dependence coming in? Let me see. Uh, 
<clears throat> and which formula you are asking? So this ratio of the two expectation barriers. Yeah, yeah. So, so you are so R. So this is the ratio. So that ratio, I'm cheating. About. That that ratio I indicated explicitly with an R. This is the finite volume expectation value of that operator divided by the infinite volume expectation value. Okay, so it is written in this omega one minus one. So you are asking where is the volume? So volume it sits in the y in ah, the so convolution. That's, the that's, that's the solution of the TBA equation. Yes, that oh. y function. Okay, and I have another question. So first of all, you're saying that there is no other operator of Yang uh, Yang Ni. But actually, there are many operators. I mean, descendant operators. Yeah, there are many descendants. Yeah, coming That's from true. some excited state TBA. Yeah, so, sure, sure. And it has been known, right? I mean, I think you worked out with a poll, no? That um, when you work out this uh, in, in yeah, in, yeah, yeah, we know the TBA for okay. all this excited state. I'm just That's saying that. So, so what we tried with Romuald a bit. So, what I can see yeah. in the Li Yang. <clears throat> So Smirnov formulation in terms of omega nm can be extended for the conserved charges, which, which are omega s1 and omega s minus one. So that I can see that I can extend, but I cannot see how his formulation could be extended beyond this point. And in this summer, I met him in uh, Bulgaria on a conference and we discussed some extent and then I asked him, do you think it's possible actually to extend your formulation for the Li Yang at all? And he said, no, <laughs> he has not. So he doesn't think it can be extended. So that's but, why we will analyze uh, sine Gordon and uh, yeah, twisted okay, sine Gordon. Can sign Gordon. I mean, although, well, the, um, even form factor formula for sine Gordon is very different from Finch Gordon form factor. No? Yes, but this Smirnov formulation for the sine Gordon, it's, it's completely well developed. The only difference is that here, actually, you have two terms in the omega, say, and you have to replace the y function with this NLIZ function. So this is 1 plus e to the i z, and then you have another term with 1 over 1 plus e to the i minus i z bar or something. Uh, uh, I, I have doubt because it's you know this uh, the company... it's already published. <laughs> it's already <laughs> published in this series of Smirnov. Well, okay. I mean, also Stefano was here in the audience. They made actually a mapping. They started to map this operator because this is a different operator basis. This omega n m. And then they already started to map in low lying states how you can map to the states in the conformal field theory. Yeah, what can I say that this uh, why the TBA of the of the Sinch Gordon and the TBA was, I mean, NRI of sine Gordon have very different behavior in UV. For example, you know, it has not just the you know polynomial of R or power mm -hmm. of R, but it has a low bar dependence, for example. No, it's in the Sinch Gordon. Yeah, Sinch Gordon. In the, the sine Gordon, you don't have log. I'm, I'm saying Sinch Gordon. So Sinch Gordon has one of a log y dependence, which is uh, not yeah. the same behavior. Yeah, 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 I agree, I agree. Sin, sine Sinch Gordon. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know why, why they are just coming at this nine one and continuation. No, no, wait. So, so, for example, I have a paper with Smirnov actually about to extend this formula in the Sinch Gordon for excited states. And in this paper, we, we calculated, although only numerically at that time, the UV limit, the finite volume correction of the free point functions. And we could compare with free point functions of the Liouville theory. And they agreed. So at least numerically, it's feasible, and you can do this. That is a deep UV limit, probably. This so is the, the UV limit. I, I mean, it depends, it depends a bit on the operator, OK? So, so you could put a, a generic alpha, for example. Here, this operator is not in the, uh, in the boson Hilbert space, sort of. And then 
the, the free point function in the UV limit is governed by the, the uh, Liouville, uh, Liouville theory. Yeah. yeah. So let me see one more point that we did also for the poles. Okay. So we extended this. This is a two component TBA, not just one component, but still you can do it. So we did the twisted ground state as an excited state also. So it's a two component system. We have the formula also here, and we could calculate three point function in a similar way. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. Indeed, so I think maybe I, I summarize uh, quickly once more. So we, we took the ground state energy and then we expand, expand it for small volume. We could see the, the scaling dimensions, conformal dimensions. We could see the bulk energy constant. And we, the first time, managed to calculate this epsilon one, the leading non-trivial correction. And then we could write it completely in terms of CFT beta. And this quantity can provide you either the mass gap relation, if you calculate for this SL2 invariant state, or it can provide you the diagonal matrix element of the perturbing operator in the CFT limit. So this is what we calculated. And then, of course, we would like to expand, extend these results in many directions. And eventually, some, <laughs> sometimes, we would like to also of course, it would be nice in this formula to identify which piece comes from the that operator and which from the perturbing operator, and to generalize, say, for a non-diagonal matrix element. Okay, mm -hmm. we are working on this. And then, if you could see which is from that y function correspond to that operator, that to the next one, and the third one, then probably a similar formula will apply also in ADS CFT in terms of the Q function of the quantum spectral curve. Yeah, so that was the motivation. Thank you for your attention. Well, before for the questions, I want to have some announcements. So we'll meet again, Julie, tomorrow at the uh, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, in Korean time, okay, Julie. Not in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I already realized the change in the schedule. So yes. Yeah, you talk about resurgence. Uh, uh. Yeah, this is the workshop I'm participating here. It's also interesting. Completely are related. Yeah. yeah. Also, we can talk more about some new result spoken there. And it's also <laughs> new what I talked about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with pleasure. Questions? Um, Soli, I have a question. So, um, can you obtain this um, structural constants or mass gap directly from the lattice model that you are working with? Uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> let me see. <laughs> so bulk energy constant comes out very naturally. This is the first mm -hmm. point. Yes. Right. Also, for the conformal dimensions, you get the <clears throat> integral equation itself. Yeah, and this form. To get the free point function, I should say in the Liang, we haven't tried, but this is was the root what was taken by the Smirnov approach and uh, Jimbo and Miva. So they oh. really went to the XXZ, the staggered XXZ, and they, they, they did this double scaled continuum limit when you got the NLIE. And this is how they ex extracted actually the fermionic operators and also the free point function, this particular diagonal free point function. Mm -hmm. Maybe they also extracted non-diagonal with a different twist. They also calculated mm -hmm. this. So this was exactly obtained by solving the lattice and taking the continuum limit and extracting the observables which survived that. Right. In the Liang, we didn't do. So you are suggesting this might be possible, like uh, similar to mm -hmm. what Sumirnov have been done? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think so. But. Uh, it's one particular model, this, this Li Yang. And then Smirnov already did this big job 
or Spinov and his company in the sign Gordon. And just as I explained, if you do this twisted version and you make a reduction, then the sign Gordon already describes all the minimum unitary minimal models. So I, I don't see the point actually to go beyond this. Even, even the Li Yang, I can tell you, even the Li Yang model, which is non-unitary minimal model, can be obtained from the sign Gordon approach. In this, in this sign Gordon NLIE, of course, as Changrin pointed out, functions are more nasty. Everything is complex. And then to see the scaling behavior and then some convergence is not so obvious. And then that, but this is what we are working on now. But related to Yung Tang's question, actually, this latest derivation of TBA is using some different uh, controlling parameter, which is elliptic modulus. So controlling and elliptic modulus along with this uh, continuum limit of a lattice model, maybe there is a way to extract out some, some UV corrections. Yeah. I think you see the thing yeah, like I, I, I see, I, 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 I yeah. By, yeah. Um, you know, parts, so it's mm. part. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could start not from the elliptic model, but directly from the trigonometric one, and then take the continuum limit, and then you immediately arrive at the CFT. Right. So, so, yeah, yeah. so going, probing near the UV, you should control with uh, the elliptic models, which is uh, related to this uh, uh, parameter R. <laughs> You cannot go, you should not go to directly it's to the not, not, not the same parameter. Right? But we are looking for some away from conformal. Uh, but uh, principally, I would like to stay at the very end only in the conformal. This was just my trick, how I approach the conformal point. But if I start from lattice, I could arrive directly to the conformal. I also think you are for some yeah. correction of a UV domain in this epsilon R, epsilon one R to the R bar, that's a correction from the from the CFT. No, 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 wait. So, so it's exactly this form which is on the right. screen. So this is how I extracted, for example, epsilon one, right. and and could manage to write completely epsilon one in terms of the CF quantities and epsilon contains of course uh, CFT data sort of but I, yeah. I went away uh, with the massive deformation I calculated this epsilon one and went back this is what I did right right, right. but but since the impact question is how to can can you obtain this energy formula by diagonalizing transform matrix of a lattice model up to not only conformal but some small correction no, no, I, the way I understood the uh, Jungfang question was, was that, let's assume I'm in a lattice model, okay? And I calculate directly the three point function in the lattice model. And then I take the continuum limit, and then, which is a CFT, say, and then I arrive at a CFT three point function from the lattice, just applying this limit for the three point function. And I think it's possible, and then I'm sure one of uh, Smirnov's paper is actually about this. Mm -hmm. They had many interesting papers, and then hard to read, actually, very long change. They change notation from paper to paper. But uh, so one, one paper is actually about the CFTD. Um, OK, thanks. I have another question. I guess using uh, this approach, it should be rather straightforward to get the defect one point function, right? In the CFT. So now you can see the boundary CFT, and then uh, this is also a kind of structure constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I think so. So for example, if you, if you take uh, a CFT, you put a defect, and then you make a defect perturbation, so you perturb away with the bulk and with the defect, then you have an extra parameter you control actually the, uh, this defect perturbation. And then uh, you could do a perturbative calculation in the defect parameter. 
And that leading order, this would be the one point function, absolute. Right. And then you could take the TBA, we know the TBA actually for the, for the energy with the defect, this defect TBA, and then mm -hmm. uh, we could expand. Yeah, absolutely, you are right, yeah. And I think based on the calculation we did, it's not much different. You could mm -hmm. generalize easily for boundary expectation values and defect expectation values, yes. I see. So um, if you say in the future, you want to compare yes. with ADS-CFT structure, maybe this is somewhat similar to the deep, deep yeah. one point function. And you Absolutely. probably already uh, see some structure in this setup in an easier way. I see. Mm, I see, I see. Okay, let me see. Uh, I meant a different defect one point function when the operator was located actually on the defect. Mm -hmm. But you are asking, what if I put the one yeah. point inside? And of inside. course, yeah, the space time in the CFT, space time dependence, it's completely determined because this right. is something like, uh, like a two point function is generic with a coefficient and then you would like to cut that coefficient yes. uh yes so uh, absolute what you will get is the integrated integrated one point function but because the space-time dependence is known then you can integrate explicitly like I, this d2 of h i integrated some different function appears yeah, yeah, then, then you could do. Actually, this was the question Romuald asked me about boundaries, uh, following uh, a question by Charlotte uh, Christiansen. And I already calculated, uh, I mean, from the perturbative approach, uh, <clears throat> what uh, that uh, you, you can extract actually this one point function. Yeah, the, this one point constant, I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the TBA is not so obvious because in the boundary TBA, uh, the two plateau values are typically not the same. And in the between, there is some, what they call breeder region that uh, maybe Roberto, Patrick, Gerard called it the breeder region. And then there you have to explicitly solve the TBA. I think that you cannot avoid. Mm. But uh, this can be done, yeah. We are quite late in time, so maybe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's thanks here. Thank you. Then let's start to the uh, third uh, informal talk. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, this time speaker is Jordan Bino, and uh, he will discuss uh, from perturbative to non perturbative in 2D ON Sigma model. Please welcome. So, thank you very much for giving me this second opportunity to present these ideas about some new results we developed in the last few years. <clears throat> I have to tell, I, I experienced some internet problem in the morning, so I couldn't join an hour ago, and I have to walk to the institute. But it's cleaning time here. It's like 6 o'clock in the morning. So, so this is a series of works which was done in collaboration with, uh, let me just quickly list the authors, Michael Abbott, who is a, a postdoc at Yale now, Janos Balog, or a colleague, and Arpad, Hegedush and or uh, former Iranian postdoc Saida Sadeyan and or uh, PhD student Istvan Bona. And we have a series of papers uh, and then uh, you are, uh, <clears throat> uh, you can take a look and, and, and see if you are interested in the details. So the generic question actually is if what if I know all perturbative coefficients, can, can I reproduce the the physical answer and can I uh, reveal the non-perturbative terms or not? And uh, you will see the answer. In some models you can do this, in some other you don't. And the class of models I'm going to, to describe the O and sigma models in a magnetic field. First I will define this model and then I will use it first. This is a very nice model in the sense that this is the closest model to QCD in two dimension in the sense that it's asymptotically free 
and it has a dynamically generated mass scale. So if you would like to do some perturbative calculation, and if you do in QCD, and if you do in this model, they are very similar. The techniques are, the steps, the techniques are basically in parallel to each other. Yeah. So, so that's why we are analyzing these models, but these models are integrable, so we can do better. We can derive uh, exact uh, thermodynamic data ansatz, and then we can sort of expand it, and then we can uh, experience. And then the reason I joined actually this project because I, I had many collaborators working on the resurgence. And I wanted to understand how, what, what this resurgence business is. And uh, I thought this, this model is a very nice model where you can really work out the details uh, uh, step by step exactly. And then you can understand. And I think I understood and I'm, I'm trying to pass this understanding to you. Okay, so first part, I will be quite general UN, and then uh, I will do perturbation theory, and then I use the integrable description, actually, to get many perturbative coefficients. And then I trust, I will try to in investigate this perturbative coefficient, and then you will see they grow like factorial. And then what can you do if they grow right like factorial? And this talk is about what are the techniques, how, how you divide by this factorial grow, so you go the so-called Borel plane and you can try to do some Borel summation, but it's ambiguous. And then how you can get rid of these ambiguities. And then uh, I will do it in detail in the O4 model <clears throat> where we went uh, the deepest sort of. And then uh, well, I, I will explain all this general structure. Then I will confront this result with the similar result in O3 and you will see they are not quite the same. And the reason is because out of the ON models, the O3 is the only one which actually has instantons. The other models, they don't have instantons. And then in the, if I will have time at the very, very end, I will just comment how you can use the Wiener-Hopf technique actually to solve this thermodyn thermodynamic beta ansatz equation. This is a linear version. And then how can you use uh, this method to, to basically completely solve the model? And then I will conclude. Okay, so let's let's see the That's definition. Good. Yes. Is there a question? Probably not. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So so I will have I, I'm going to be in two dimension quantum field theory. I will have n scalar fields and they live on the sphere. So there is a this nonlinear constraint such that if you square this scalar fields one to n is just one. Okay. So because they live on the sphere, you have a big symmetry. And this is a, a, a global O n symmetry. And then you can just pick pick actually one one O n charge, uh, say which corresponds to rotation in the in the phi sense in the one two plane. And then you can couple a magnetic field to this charge. And then in order to have a Hamiltonian which is shown here, which is just shifted by the charge, then actually what you have to do, you have to modify your Lagrangian in this very specific way. And then uh, this is actually like, uh, like uh, coupling to a, a gauge field, which has only time component. And then, uh, this is the minimal coupling you could do. So this is the Euclidean Hamiltonian with the bare coupling. And what we would like to do, what is the observable we would like to calculate? We would like to calculate in this magnetic field, the free energy density. And then this is a very nice quantity because you can formulate in, in the path integral. You can also do perturbation theory and doing perturbation theory, what you do, you just expand one of the fields. And then I will explain it's even, this is a bit, uh, not so trivial. So you expand one of the fields in terms of the others, and then you assume the, the fluctuations are small, and you expand the Lagrangian and you do perturbation theory. You do it in dimensional regularization, and then you introduce running coupling and so on. So once you calculated the free energy density, then you can calculate some other observables which are easier to handle actually in the integrable settings. And this is the the, you can make a Lejeune transform and you will get the ground state energy density as a function of the density. So this perturbative calculation actually very hard. 
And then we did it some years ago to third order. At this time, this was actually, this is in the ads correspondence because there were two uh, string theory calculation which didn't agree. And then we, we wanted to resolve this discrepancy. And actually doing this calculation, it was clear that one of them was correct, the other was not. So the next slide is uh, how we did this perturbative calculation. And then I will be very quick now because this is just uh, perturbation theory. But what the point I would like to make that in principle, you could use the Lagrangian and do perturbative calculation to calculate all the perturbative co co uh, coefficients, but they are so complicated. So <laughs> of course, this is not the way which will which, which you want to proceed and which will win in the end. So a uh, two loop, you have to evaluate these two diagrams. And then of course, because you have divergences, you did it in dimensional regularization. So, so you have to introduce uh, counter terms, running coupling, and then eventually, and then the dynamically generated scale. We do, did the calculation in MS bar. So you use the MS bar scale. <clears throat> there is a quantity which appears how I parameterize this N and this capital Delta. And then you can do the calculation for generic N. And then we did the calculation up to this order and we expressed this free energy density in terms of this running coupling, which somehow summed up the, this uh, logarithm in the magnetic field, this dimensional as coupling, the magnetic field divided by this lambda MS bar. Another point, I would like to make that this is a perturbative expansion and it goes in terms of age, which is part of the Lagrangian. In the spirit of my previous thought, you are starting from the UV theory and then you express your quantities in terms of the UV coupling and then the UV scale, the Islam to MS bar scale. And then of course we will do the same from the integrable, from the masses, and then we have to relate these two. And this was the first calculation actually when this was related. And this is a very nice work and I will just cite the authors when I reach that point. So you can make a Lausanne transform. And then as I told you, you can express, for example, the energy density as a function of the, of the density in terms of this uh, another running coupling, which is defined actually depending uh, in a way in which it depends on the density. So this is the calculation you can do. And then, as I told you, this is very hard calculation. And then you could do only at, at that order. And then it's really difficult to push further. So what we will do now, we will use, use that this theory is integrable. So we have an integrable scattering theory, uh, which is relativistic. So the dispersion relation is such that the energy as a function of the momentum is this square root, which you can resolve by introducing the rapidity variable. So the momentum is M times inch theta and the energy is M times cos theta. And then the effect of the introducing this charge that out of in, in this scattering theory, actually you have N particles which form an O N uh, representation and dimensional, the fundamental representation for O N. But if you introduce this magnetic field, then uh, two particles became charged until this uh, SON transformation. And then this shifts one of the energies of one of the particles with plus H, the other with minus H, and then leaves the other N minus two particle invariant. So what you can do, you can start to increase the magnetic field. And then what you will see that some particles get negative energy. So they start to feel the ground state and they will form a condensate. And this condensate will depend how big the magnetic field because, uh, uh, so what you do typically, you, you go to finite volume to regulate, and then <clears throat> you can only put a finite number of particles, they form the bond state. And then uh, there is going to be so uh, a large number of particles and you can represent them some particle density. And this is the sky of theta. <clears throat> And then uh, this density will vanish some, some point, magnetic field dependent uh, point, this capital B, how, how far this density fills the, the gap. 
So this is a very dense state. Yeah, there are no holes, only particles, fully dense. And then the aim is to calculate this density. The way you do, because you, you are in an integrable theory, so you introduce this magnetic field. So out of this N multiplet of particles, which actually scatter on each other in a very complicated S matrix and N square times N square S matrix. This is very complicated one, but, uh, and it's hard to describe the ground state. But if you already push the particles that only one of them uh, condensed in the ground state, then this one particle scatters on itself, just a single S matrix, a single phase, a rapidity dependent phase. And it's written for the ON model here. And you should remember delta is, is, is one over N minus two. So then, then in order, since you are a finite volume, you quantize the momenta using this beta ansatz equation. And then what you do, you take the logarithm and then, uh, and this will determine in the thermodynamic limit, it will, it will uh, um, result in a linear integral equation for this he. This is the thermodynamic limit of that logarithm of the beta ansatz equation. And sometimes you call it thermodynamic beta ansatz equation. It's not thermodynamic in the sense that it's not finite temperature. So that's why actually it's linear, but uh, the terminology somehow is the same, that it's, it's a thermodynamic beta ansatz. So what is, 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 is a bit complicated about this integral equation is that uh, you integrate only for the support of this density, which is between minus B or B. And otherwise, chi vanishes outside. So you have to solve this linear integral equation, which is quite, uh, quite difficult. But the claim is that if you solve it and if you could expand it, then, then you should see the the other terms. So how to obtain these observables I already introduced. So the density, the particle density is nothing just the integral of this rapidity density, the density in the rapidity space. And then if you just sum up the energies of these particles, you got the ground state energy density. And then uh, in order, if you really would like to relate the magnetic field for example, to this B parameter that appeared here, or the rho, then uh, you have to use this minimizing condition. So this is the answer. And uh, let me see. And then uh, why this theory was introduced, because uh, you can not a simple, very complicated way, but nevertheless, you can expand this TBA. I will explain how to expand it. And if you expand it, then uh, you can compare with the Lagrangian expansion, and then you can relate this parameter m, the mass, which appears here, to the lambda ms bar. And this is a very famous calculation, which was done by Hasen, Franz Major, and Niedermeyer. And this is actually triggered uh, even Alyosha Zamolochikov to derive his DBA equation, because this paper came out, and and uh, actually Hasen, Franz, and Niedermeyer, they are Hungarians, and I, I knew them very well. And they told me that Alyosha got so excited and then he visited them in Bern and he tried to learn these techniques. And then, then he came out with his paper about the TBA in the relativistic scattering. So this is a famous calculation, but the, our idea is no go further. So let's try to expand not just the first term, but they did, but go higher order. And it is notoriously difficult. So it really um, resisted solution for a very long time. And the new insight came from Dima Volin, who actually solved the problem in a kind of completely different way. Uh, not, not by the, the standard expansion of linear integration. And his idea was that uh, let's introduce the resolvent of this function. Uh, of the unknown function. So this resolvent is analytic everywhere on the complex plane, except the cut, such that the jump on the cut is, is the unknown function, okay? So, so clearly this is a good quantity. If the resolvent, if you could evaluate the infinite asymptotics, you, you, you could re reduce immediately the row density I'm searching for. On the other hand, I could go and make a Laplace transform of this quantity. 
And the lop does transform at the particular position is nothing, just the energy density. So the basic insight, maybe I just, it came from the following. Uh, it's also called the matched asymptotics. Let me just put all this formula here. Yeah. So the idea is the following. <clears throat> so he solved separately, not really solved. He made a very clever ansatz for the resolvent and it's, uh, it's Laplace transform, which were valid in, in separate region. So he could manage to expand the Laplace transform. It also based a bit, uh, based a bit of the Wienerhoff technique around the edge. So, so this is an expansion here and then plugging back the analytic and asymptotic structure. So actually this analytic, this large S asymptotics can be calculated from the Wienerhoff and then just uh, knowing the analytic structure of this function, he, he knew how to parameterize it in terms of this capital Q quantity. So this is valid near the edge. And then we, because we know we have this jump, so, so we could expand this function in the rapidity space, the original variable, not the Laplace variable, in, in, into this form. And then he just, uh, in the overlapping region, he just assumed that these two forms should be valid in the same time. And somehow it determined all the C and Q coefficients, all of them. So <laughs> if you can, so this is, this reduces the quantum field theoretic calculation or the expansion of the, this linear integral equation in, into solving algebraic equation. And of course you can solve algebra, algebraic equations. So once you solve algebraic equation, you just removing some prefactors, you can calculate perturbatively actually, rho and epsilon. <clears throat> and then how does the result look like? So they look something like this. So, so this is the perturbative expansion and the large magnetic field. It's like large B. So we are expanding in one over B. Okay, first perturbative coefficients, you see a rational number plus something appears, which I would say log two, which I would say is transcendentality one, say at the first order, second order, a rational number, and then you have something transcendentality two, and the third order, it starts to appear at zeta three. And then in general, what you will see that an, at a given order, and you will have uh, an expression which has log twos, zeta or the zeta functions and rational numbers such that the maximal transcendentality is exactly that order. Okay, and then you calculate uh, the energy and you got something the same. So, so because you have these expressions, even though you can do the calculation analytically, if you are going to higher and higher orders, you have lots of zeta functions and log twos. So this, the, these expressions grow like exponentially large and many, many, many terms. So technically, it's not easy to calculate them. So Dima calculated like the first 22 coefficients and tried to, to investigate them. And that was this other company, Marcos Marino and uh, Tomas Reis. And then they, they calculated 44. And then uh, we calculated a bit more, but this is not the point I would like to make because uh, yeah. And then uh, eventually what is the observable you would like to analyze? say this is the free energy density as a function of the running coupling. And then you can also calculate these quantities. Yeah, one interesting observation. So in this quantity, log two disappear. So it has only zeta function. This is the quantity you would calculate from field theory. So maybe that's the reason. So here the expressions are a bit simpler and then that's how we got this 40, 50 analytic coefficients. But, uh, the, yes. Okay. So, and then I make this comment here that comparing the first term, because here you got it uh, like an expansion in H over M. This is the running coupling on that side. And then you could do in the field theory, and then you could match this ex uh, these two expansions. And then you can relate the mass gap, <clears throat> the mass to this lambda 
QCD, the dynamically generated uh, scale, and the result in the OOM model takes this form, this very famous and, and first, first result in this case. So I have this perturbative coefficient, first 50 analytically, and I would like to see their asymptotics. So, or, or I would like to see whether it, they, how they give back uh, the physical quantities I would like to calculate. And then, uh, so what happens that uh, these coefficients grow like factorial. So here I show how they grow. So this is, for example, the expansion of this, um, yeah, I should somehow do that. The expansion of the free energy as a function of alpha. Okay. And uh, uh, they grow like two to the, I mean, one over two. So it, it's just, uh, yeah, two to the some factor. Yeah. I mean, two minus factor. So you compensate such that that guy actually has a constant asymptotics. But the point I would like to make that they grow like factorial. So we would like to understand the, the asymptotic behavior of this growth. And to understand the asymptotic behaviors, we could do it numerically. I mean, this is the kind of techniques what I'm going to use. It's called resurgence. And in many examples, people uh, did it uh, numerically. So I got some insight from uh, virtually Inesha Cheto and uh, Mikhail Spalinski and Jakub Jankowski. And I asked them what they did. And they said, well, ah, we just calculated the first 200 coefficients so numerically with high precision, and we could extract something. And then we tried, and we couldn't really extract from 200 coefficients. But in the O4 model, we could calculate 2,000 coefficients, 7,000 digits. And this is what we did for this row, epsilon, this normalized one, I removed the factors. And then for the free energy, we got like 1,400 coefficients with 4,000 digits. So now you can really make some experimental mathematics with these numbers. So what can you do? So first, we established that this is really how the perturbative coefficients grow. So how do it, if you normalize in this way, then there is a constant piece. And then to, for example, to get this constant, the idea is the following. So, so there is a constant and then these terms are a bit alternating. So there is another constant multiplying minus one to the N. So, so you will see odd and even pieces are different. And then you disentangle this guy in this way. So actually you can disentangle the whole series into the, to the even and the odd part. And then the even part behaves like a constant plus one over n and so on. So how to measure this A, for example, precisely? And the idea is to use the Richardson transform. So if you have a series which behaves like this, then you can just make another series where uh, basically you multiply with n plus one, the A n plus one term and subtract n times A n. And the result of this transformation that you can kill actually this one over n term here. So this series has a correction only b to the n squared. So you can do this transformation 100 times and the correction will be something like some coefficient divided by n to the 100 plus one. So if this is really small, if you go very high, so you can get very precisely this constant. And I'm just showing here in some numerical plots how doing an first 10, 100 Richardson transform, you get the deviation from the asymptotic value really small. So this is a kind of uh, precision mathematics, precision numeric, how you can uh, extract the asymptotic behavior of your perturbative. What, what can you do with the perturbative series which grows uh, like factorial? So it's nice that we have a path integral interpretation. So for example, I'm talking now about the Ofer model. If you calculate this free energy density, then there is a path integral for these fields with an action. And then you can think a bit evaluating this path integral that you just integrate uh, uh, first, yeah. Let's integrate for field configuration to the specific action, okay? And then we integrate 
of course, the action must be positive definite. We integrate from zero to infinity with that action here. So, so this is a kind of restricted way of evaluating in two steps. Yeah. And then what is nice in this sense that uh, then the physical answer we are looking for is obtained in the so-called Borel transform. So, so then in this calculation, when you do perturbation theory, you sum up not the perturbative series, but you sum up the CN coefficient, exactly the one which has a nice constant asymptotic and which are actually convergent. Okay, so, so this is called the, the Borel function when instead of uh, the perturbative coefficients times say the running coupling, you, you multiply the perturbative coefficients divided by this factorial and possibly with the factor of, of some, uh, some uh, actually it's related typically to the instant on a red or normal action to some power. Uh, this is how you go to the Borel plane. And if you sum up this function and integrate in this way, this is the Laplace transform, inverse Borel transform, the Laplace transform, then you will get the physical quantity. So this is basically the rule how we are supposed to use this and deal with this factorial divergence. And because this CN guy had a constant asymptotics, then, then on the Borel variable, on the Borel plane, we have a finite convergence radius, which with this two to the n plus one normalization is just one. So what is the analytical structure? So we, since we have many perturbative terms, we can calculate the, this Borel function. And in order to get an idea about the analytic structure, we can make a body approximant and we can search for the pole for the, uh, Uh, just, uh, there is no sound there. Maybe you have some problem. Oh. Uh, now we can hear your voice. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe it's just a good box. Okay, so, so what you can see now that you have this one single isolated pole. You have many, many poles starting at minus one indicating that possibly, because we, we truncated this series, that should be a cut starting here. And then we, could, we can see that uh, there is also this other cut starting at two. Yes, but you should you remember in, in this uh, Laplace transform, I have to integrate from zero to infinity on the real line. So in theories, if you do the same analysis, there are theories when you, you do exactly that analysis and you cannot see any singularity on the positive real line. Those theories are Borel summable and you can just do the integral and you got the physical answer. But this is not <clears throat> our case because in our case, we have this pole, we have the cut. So we have to deviate the integration contour. We could integrate a bit above, or we could integrate a bit below. So let's do it. And then let's denote this F plus minus, whether I integrate a bit above or below. But of course, the, there is a difference between the two. And then it's easy to see, for example, if you just calculate the difference between the two, then you have to calculate the residue of the, this pole. So there is going to be an, an ambiguity between these two calculations which goes in the coupling, this alpha is small, e to the minus two over alpha. So this is a non-perturbative term. So we cannot see this term in the perturbation theory, or, <laughs> or actually we can see the, this term in the perturbation theory, but the way we see it, we go to the Porel plane and we see this pole. So then we ask the question that, okay, let's, I choose F plus. How does it compare to uh, how does it compare to the analytical or numerical solution of the TPA? Yeah, just maybe one, one more point. So when, when we integrate this Borel function here, uh, if we could, if we would integrate here term by term, we, we could, we would get back the, 
the perturbative series. So it's no point to integrate that function. So what we have to integrate, for example, on this path, some analytic continuation of this function. So this function is, is well-defined only on the unit circle, and you have to integrate all of the unit circle. So we have to continue. And this body approximant is one continuation. It's relatively good, but there are better continuations. And this actually what goes under the name the conformal mapping. And in QCD, indeed, they use this conformal mapping in the same way. So the techniques I'm telling you, it's, it's actually used in QCD, although not for 2,000 terms, but for five terms or six terms. So this conformal mapping is nicer in the sense that if you know your functions, that it has some cuts on the negative half line starting at minus one and plus one, then you can change your variables from the Borel T variables for these U variables. This is the conformal mapping. And it maps the entire T plane except the two cuts on the unit circles. So if you do not have any singularity outside the cuts, that your function after the conformal map mapping will be convergent on the unit disk. And then, and there you can integrate. So the idea is that use this perturbative series in T to calculate the perturbative series in U, which is a nicely continued and convergent series, and that plug back and integrate. And then it's much more precise, like integrating the body approximate. And then here I a bit show how this uh, constant uh, circles on, after the conformal mapping looks in the original plane. And you see they are uh, uh, avoiding the cuts. And then if you go larger and larger circles, like absolute value 0.9, almost that, it's, it's, it really goes beyond the cut. So we had that many coefficients. So we calculated numerically. Uh, F plus and F minus. And then we wanted to compare to the numerical solution of the TBA. So we solved the TBA, we went to a Chebyshev basis, and then we could solve it like 30 digits precision. So what is the difference of the numerical solution of the TBA and the one we calculated in, the, in, in, in this ambiguous, although we decided we take, for example, F plus wave. So first of all, this F plus has an imaginary part. And I told you this imaginary part is exponentially small. This is non-perturbative corrections. And by numerically fitting, we, we could calculate this coefficient, okay? How the leading exponential part had this coefficient, and there was a subleading exponential correction, non-perturbative correction. And then it was a series here. There was no series here. And we calculated these coefficients. I mean, fitted numerically from this data. What was even more surprising, because you could say just, OK, let's integrate a bit above, integrate a bit below, and average. And then the imaginary part will disappear, and I will be happy with the real part. You could do it. And you could compare to TBA, but what you will see that there is going to be an even smaller discrepancy, exponentially small discrepancy between the numerical solution of the TBA and this integral. So you see this Borel integral a bit above integrating, taking the real part does not reproduce the real physical value. There is a very small exponential discrepancy. We, we could manage from the numerics to fit this coefficient. So the rest of the talk is to understand how we could calculate the C guys, these non-perturbative corrections, and the D guys just from the perturbative series. And I'm telling you that we can do it. So resurgence theory actually tells you how to do it. So in order to do it, you, you have to make a more detailed asymptotic analysis. So what you have to do, so we already calculated our function on the Borel plane. We have seen this ball, we have seen the cut, these two cuts, but let's, let's try to understand somehow the nature of the cut. And then in order to understand it, what you would do is, uh, you calculate the asymptotics of your CN coefficients. And then you see this alternating part. 
and you see the non-alternating part. And then I already told you how to calculate this leading P plus guy or P minus, but subtracting this guy, you can go further and you can calculate this, this uh, one over N, one over N times N minus one and so on corrections. So, so this, these guys can be fitted like a first uh, 30, 40, 50, depending how many perturbative coefficients you have with high precision. But what is the meaning of these terms. So let's for, let's take for example this this alternating part. So if you take the alternating part, you pick the first guy, and then you have if the c n coefficient were just this p minus time minus one to the n, you plug back your Borel function, you sum up, then you will see there is a pole. There is a pole at t equals minus one. Okay, but about the next one? So you sum up this guy, and then it's going to be the log one plus t. If you sum up this guy, then it will be a function one plus t times log one plus t. So if you calculate these perturbative coefficients here, these coefficients p, p, z, p minus zero, one, and so on, this will give the expansion of a function which multiplies the logarithmic cut. So in this uh, calculus, in the resurgence literature, there is a, a, a notation. Just how, how do we denote this perturbative series, this function who, who has this perturbative series, and this is called the alien derivative. So the alien derivative, delta minus one acting on the original function psi, this is the Borel function, was phi, so this is psi is the Borel function. So the alien derivative acting at, for example, minus one is basically a function which has perturbative coefficients appearing in the asymptotics of this guy, which you calculate, and, but this is basically the function multiplying the cup. And then you could do the same here. And then you will see this is the alien derivative at two, the function multiplying the logarithmic cut. And you see in this case, if it's a pole, if it were just a pole, then you wouldn't have this coefficient. Higher guy is just the leading one. If it's really a cut, then, then you have more terms. And then how would a cut starting at two sh show up in this case? It would show up like you have a term two to the minus n times a similar series. And then this perturbative coefficient, these coefficients are the perturbative coefficients of the alien derivative of this function at two, okay? So, but there is a big literature, how to calculate these alien derivatives and then how to deal with them. But this is the definition what I just provided. Okay, so let's see, let's do this analysis and let's calculate the this alien derivatives of the physical quantity. So, so we calculated P minus for like 150 digits. And then just uh, looking at it, then you realize this is nothing but minus E times eight over pi for really 100 digits. Actually, we calculated for thousands of digits, but this was as precise. Uh, this value was like for 150 digits, that value. And the next was zero, and then you start to calculate, and you see if you go higher and higher order, you have the same transcendentality structure. You have just just odd zeta functions, okay? And then you could do the same. Uh, it is p plus the this, and you could see this is zero for that many digits. So indeed, it was really just a pole there, and then nothing there. And then you could calculate also the the contribution of the cut, and then you have this uh, other prefactor. And that we fitted uh, these numbers. Actually, at that time, we just used uh, uh, easy face web page, and then this is uh, how we use, but it's a built-in function in Mathematica, which you can use to calculate these terms. So, so this is the analytic structure. We have a pole here. We have a logarithmic cut starting here. So when we integrate a bit above or below, then, then we can just from this coefficient, we can read off the ambiguity, okay, what we have. And then because it's a logarithmic cut, we know how it will contribute from these coefficients. 
So, so we did the integral, we calculated this term, and then we compared what we got previously, and then they were exactly the same. So this is how you can calculate from the asymptotics, this, this uh, non-perturbative ambiguity uh, directly. So I think it's very nice, but can we get the real ambiguity? It would be really great. To get the real ambiguity, then uh, you have to use this uh, resurgence techniques, I should say, because what you have to do, so, so what happens if you, if you calculate above and below? The difference between the two collects the contributions of the cuts. So you have to understand uh, the jump of this function on the Borel plane on the real line. And then I'd already told you that the, the, the alien derivative calculates the logarithmic jump. So one introduces the, this uh, integration a bit above and below, and the difference can be written as integrating something, and this something is the alien derivative. This is obvious, the first guy. But what is interesting that this, this function I, I just calculated here, this I, I stopped here, but I could go 80 terms. And if you go to 80 terms, you will see this is also factorial growing. So if this guy is factorially growing, then it, 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 it has also an alien derivative. So this logarithmic cut, the function multiplying the logarithmic cut has also a logarithmic cut. So, so then, then you have other terms, the cut of the cut, and then uh, you have to really take into account all of them. And the nice way is this so-called alien calculus. So this alien derivative exactly divides such a way that you can, you can just calculate what happens if you, if you make a jump a bit above and it's summarized in the, in the Stokes automorphism, which is exactly defined that uh, what is the function I have to integrate below such that it would be the same, the function, I, the original function I integrated above. And you can write the Stokes automorphism just in terms of this alien derivative in this way. Okay. And uh, the answer for this problem of this resurgence problem <clears throat> is that you have to take the median resummation. So this means you have to take the square root of this automorphism. And then this is how you have to integrate. So <clears throat> if you would like to get the physical answer, you have to integrate exactly the square root of the, the Stokes automorphism. This, and then this means some coefficients has the one half, one over eight. So this is the physical answer we have to calculate. So we have to calculate, you see, we already calculated the alien derivative of this function at one from the asymptotics at two, but we have to calculate this further alien derivatives. So this is the asymptotics of the asymptotics function, what we extracted. And then uh, actually we did this calculation, yeah. And then uh, I should tell it, it gave back exactly the numbers what we fit. So what did we do once more? We made this media resummation. Actually it turned out that delta is delta three F for zero. And we calculated this delta two squared, the asymptotics of the asymptotics. And we did it actually in the variable B, and then we switched to the running coupling constant, and that 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 we could get just from the perturbative series, we got an answer how the 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 Borel resummation, the median resummation of the perturbative series should look like, and then we compare to the numerical solution of the TBA, and now they completely agree. So I mean they agreed with up to some other, oh, the next order term here, but also there are other exponential correction later, but this order they very nicely agreed. So this is a kind of way how you could get this result. Okay, so, but what do we expect in general? So we, in, in general, we expect that there are, in, in the TBA result, result can be written as an expansion, a double expansion. There is a perturbative expansion we already discussed with this uh, actually exponentially uh, factorially growing coefficient. But there is an additional expansion which, which 
contains all these other exponentially suppressed non-perturbative terms. And the, those coefficients for the other exponentials are only also asymptotic growing factorial. So in this case, we will go to the Borel plane and then we will integrate a bit above the cut. So, but these coefficients should be such that if you integrate above the cut, then, then they compensate each other that the ambiguity of the first term is canceled, canceled by the integral of the next term. So eventually this whole expression is not ambiguous and it gives a physical answer. And to get from one term to the next, so this is called a trans series. And then to get from one to the other, you have to investigate the asymptotics of the perturbative terms. So, so the leading m equals zero, the leading term in the trans series are just the perturbative coefficient. From the large n asymptotics of these perturbative corrections, you can actually calculate the next order terms and you plug them there such that you can sell the ambiguity coming from the perturbative. <clears throat> and then uh, analyzing the asymptotics, for example, of this second guy, you already got the next order terms in the trans series. And then this ambiguity, the cancellation, so to cancel the ambiguity of this guy, we introduce this term to cancel the ambiguity of this guy, it's a double cancellation. It's something exponentially small remains. And then this is this deviation, what we observed before, and this is what should be there in the physics. So this is the kind of answer and the form of the answer, what we got, but we calculated only the first three. And then I would like to just tell that uh, we, we extended all this analysis uh, in the O4 model because we did it in numerically. And then we extended actually at, at an elevated at the uh, analytical level. But that's, I, I, I'm not going to explain now, but we, we could sort of, you remember we had this algebraic equation and then we could just solve the asymptotic limit uh, of this algebraic equation. And we got the same numbers we got it before, even more analytically, but we just fitted numerically. What is more interesting that we repeated the same analysis for O3. So what is the difference compared to O4? So first of all, in the Borel plane, it, they grow factorial still, but on the Borel plane, you have no cut in this case on the negative real line. You have only on the positive. Yeah, I didn't tell you, but the, the, the physical interpretation of those non-perturbative correction is not trivial. It's, it's not so obvious what it should be. Because we know, know that like O4, in the O4 model, there is no instant. If there were instant on a saddle point of the part integral and then some expansion, this is a very, yeah, just maybe let's make this point. So this is very natural in a theory where you have multi-instantons from a path integral point of view because you have the perturbative coefficients, then you have the one instanton action, then you would have the fluctuations around the one instanton, then you have a two instanton, and then you have the fluctuations around the two instanton. So this would be very natural form. And then in the message in this case that the perturbative series has all the information about the instanton fluctuations, which is surprising or not surprising. Yeah since they come from the Lagrangian and the instanton comes from the Lagrangian, so maybe it's not so surprising. So, but in the O4, there are no instantons and they are related to renormalons, uh, at least in the large N. So, but about O3. So in the O3, we don't have this part. Yeah, the negative one, we have only the positive one. And then we repeat the same game. So we calculate the asymptotics of the perturbative coefficients. We can read off the residue of the pole. And then, and then we calculate uh, the, the subtract this pole. We calculate the rest. Then we can see the, the cut starting at two. We calculate their coefficient. We can even calculate uh, uh, their asymptotics. And then we can tell what should be the imaginary part of the deviation of the Borel resummation and the numerical solution of the TBA. And then we have some expected deviation, which should be A to the minus eight over alpha for the real part. 
And then we do the numerics and what we found, it's completely different. So this real, the imaginary deviation is correct, but the real deviation is not. It's, it's much, much bigger. It's already starts e to the minus two over alpha. And there is an expansion even having log alpha. But actually, in exactly at that point, we have uh, the instantons when this guy appearing. But you see, the, this is a deviation or a part in the trans series, which was not involved at all in the asymptotics of the perturbative series. So are they instantons? It's not clear. And then uh, it's, it's a question how much you are interested in. <laughs> I could stop here and conclude. And uh, I have some few slides how you can actually solve this uh, linear integral equation uh, kind of ex exactly and expand the solution. Do you want me to explain this too? Uh, can you uh, like uh, explain like a uh, uh, wrap up within the like uh, one or two minutes? Sorry, yeah, yeah, very, yeah, sure. <laughs> So I can I can just tell you actually the idea. Okay, so the idea is that uh, extend the convolution to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. The price you pay, some unknown function appears on the other side, and then you can use Fourier transform. And then in the Fourier space, you have to invert the kernel. And then, but because these functions, these unknown functions are defined just for left or right, not the whole line. So their Fourier transform has specific analytic properties. So analytic either on the lower on the upper half plane. So you can, after doing Fourier transform, you can just project to the, to the component, which is analytic in the lower on the upper half plane. And that gives an integral allocation, a solution into a form. And then on the, the, the projector is an integral on the ring line, and then you can deform this contour. And then doing this calculation, actually you can calculate in the O3 model, this unexpected uh, non-perturbative correction from directly from the TBA. And I should mention that uh, this nice way of doing it was first done by Markov Marlin and his collaborators. They calculated the first three terms, and then we went further and calculated some more. So conclusions. So, so maybe the main conclusion is that uh, the perturbative coefficients, if you really know a lot, a lot of perturbative coefficients, it, it, it knows basically about everything of your theory. This is uh, the first. And then I would refine that uh, this is not always true. And it's, it's true for any O and except O3, for example. And then it's true for many other models. Uh, and the way you can extract non-perturbative corrections if you that you have to analyze the asymptotic behavior, this asymptotic factorial growth of your perturbative corrections in very detailed way. And then if you are lucky, then all these perturbative coefficients has all the knowledge about non-perturbative physics. And the final answer is given in a trans series form. So that's uh, the conclusion. Thank you. Uh, due to the schedule, uh, please ask us some urgent question. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, this uh, how 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 far you can apply this uh, wisdom coming from integral models to non-integral models, such as O3 with the theta. Uh, oh. <clears throat> yes, that is a paper about O3 with theta term by uh, Marcos Marino and his collaborators. Oh. And uh, there are two, two values of theta when the model is integrable, theta equals zero and theta equals pi. And then in a theta equals pi, you can repeat the same analysis and then you will get uh, slightly different terms. And then from this, you can sort of conjecture which comes from, uh, uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> which comes from uh, instantons and which not, and because renormalons change sign differently for as a function of theta than uh, instantons, and you can disentangle a bit them. But in, in, in between, you don't really know, but uh, still uh, you can conjecture just from these values something like. 
but maybe a bit more interesting, how, how much can we learn for QCD? And then uh, there are papers from in the research literature, how you can improve your perturbative series. For example, you calculate like first five terms, but if you know the analytic structure on the Borel plane, for example, that you have this cut where they start, then all, even out of these five terms using the conformal mapping, building in where the cuts are, and then you, you can get uh, five order terms after the conformal mapping, and that you can re-expand in the original variables, and then you can generate higher perturbative terms, which are very good and very close to the would be real values. I mean, you could repeat the same calculation one order less, and you see this is very good prediction for high number of perturbative coefficients in QCD. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, uh, because of time, let's move to the next uh, uh, session. And before that, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. <clears throat>